uh, we're going to be continuing our series that we started last week called The Harvest, where we're looking at this idea that God wants to use each of us, including you, uh, to do the work that he set before us, that we have a purpose and a mission in this life. And last week, what we looked at is we looked at how we are God's representatives, that what we do, what we say, or what we don't do, or what we don't say, how we treat those around us tells them something about Jesus, good, bad, or otherwise. That the only idea, the only picture that many people have of who Jesus is and what he's about is how Christians treat them. And I would encourage you, if you missed last week, to go back and and watch it. You can go to our website or our YouTube channel to watch last week's message. Or uh, you can go to your favorite podcasting app and listen to it on your drive to work or while you're working out in the gym if you prefer to listen to it that way. Because what we're going to look at today really builds off this idea that we started last week, that we are God's representatives. And what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at, all right, now that we understand that, let's look at what we are to do with that. How can we actually represent God well? What does it mean to be his representatives? And we're going to dive into that in just a minute. But first, before we get there, I want to start off with a question. Because I think many of us, I think many Christians, many followers of Jesus have the wrong understanding of what our goal actually is as Christians. See, I think this should be a question that we should pause and ask ourselves. What's the goal of followers of Jesus? What's our goal? What should we be driving after? What should, what, should, what should we be going for? I think if we were to take just a poll, just go up to random Christians or even random people and ask, what's the purpose for Christians? What's the goal of Christians? I think we would get answers like, uh, well, the goal is to get to heaven. The goal is to avoid sin. The goal is to not do anything bad and instead do something good. And a lot of the answers I think we would get really center around what we can get out of it. It centers around us getting to heaven. Us earning salvation. But you see, I don't think that's the goal of Christians. I don't think that's the purpose, the mission that God has given us. See, I would argue this, that the goal of Christians should not be to get to heaven. The goal of Christians should not be to get to heaven. Listen, Jesus has already done that for us. We don't have to worry about that. Our goal shouldn't be to get to heaven. Rather, our goal should be be to bring heaven to earth. The goal of Christians is not to get to heaven. The goal of Christians is to bring heaven to earth. These are the marching orders that God has given us. He's already done the heavy lifting. He's already paved the way for our salvation. He's already paved the way for our eternal life with him. Our goal, our response to that is to bring heaven to earth. And if we're honest, there's a lot of places that look like hell on earth, isn't there? There's a lot of people that are hurting. There's a lot of people that are living in really dark places in our work, at our school, our neighborhoods, and across the world. I've found that even people that appear to have a good life, that appear to have it all together on the inside, they're broken. They're hurting. They don't know what to do. There are people all around us that are in desperate need of Christians to understand their mission of bringing heaven to earth because they need that. They need that hope. They need what Jesus can provide for them. And our goal as followers of Jesus should be to bring heaven to them. So, how do we do that? Maybe that sounds great to you, but how do we actually do that? And I think... I would argue we do that by showing compassion. We do that by taking the compassion that God has for us and bringing it to those around us. And so what I want to look at today is I want to look at how we can embody this compassion, how we can embody the heart that God has for us and take that to those around us. And we're going to do this by looking at two words. We're going to dive deep into two words. And now these words uh, come from the Bible But they're not English words. I don't know if you know this, but the Bible wasn't originally written in English. It was written in three ancient and now considered dead languages, and it's been translated into many languages, including English. But there's a problem. When you translate from an ancient language into a modern language, there's often not a one-for-one word. 
It's not like you have this word in the ancient language and this word in the modern language. Oftentimes, translators have to try to figure out what this word modern equivalent is or how we can translate this idea that this ancient word carries into a modern word. And it often provides some difficulty. And sometimes what happens is we miss the richness and the depth of what God is trying to communicate to us through his word because we don't know what the original word meant. You see, the Bible was originally written in primarily Hebrew in the Old Testament and then Greek and Aramaic in the New Testament. I want to look at two words today. One is an Old Testament word in Hebrew and the other one is a New Testament word in Greek. And I think what these words will do is they'll help us understand who God is pointing his compassion to and what kind of compassion he has for his people. I think that these words will help us get a richness and a depth to help us understand what God is calling us to do. So the first word that we're going to look at is the Hebrew word, and it's found throughout the Old Testament, and it's often used to show us, show us who God is pointing his compassion to. God is directing his compassion to these people. And this word is anawim. Now, you can say it with me if you're not too embarrassed to say it with the people you're around. Anawim. I'm sure you sound so smart. You can use that word to impress uh, your friends. And I'm going to read through a few verses so you can see how this word is used in just a minute. But first, let me explain what this word means. If you were to look up this word in, in the translations that you probably have, most Bible translations translate this word as poor, as in having no money, the poor, not my last name. And yes, I got made fun of that all the time for having no money, but that's, that's really not what this word is talking about. There are other words in the Hebrew language that, that better translate as the poor. This word kind of takes it a step further. This word really paints a picture. It paints a picture of who these people are. You see, a more literal translation of anoim would be wretched or hunched up to cringe, abnormally thin, suffering, or humiliated. Do you see the word picture that's coming into your head? The anoim are abnormally thin, they're suffering, they're humiliated. You see, if I could translate it, this, the word anoim, I might say it this way. It's the throwaway people. It's the people who, who are in great suffering, but we just walk on by. It's the people who have a great need, but we turn our head and we don't pay attention to them. It's the social outcasts, those who exist on the fringe of society. It's the people that, that beg on the street corners, the people that live on the other side of the world in poverty that we can't even understand. It's those who have great need, but little attention is given to them. But you see, the Anuim isn't just for those with physical needs. It's also those who are maybe appear to have it all together on the outside, but on the inside, they're falling apart. We might not know their struggles. We might not even know they're struggling. But on the inside, they're barely getting out of bed in the morning. They're barely making it through their day, their marriage, their family. It's falling apart. They've been hurt. They've been abused. They've been neglected. Those two are the Anawim, the people that society doesn't know about and honestly probably doesn't really care about. It's the throwaway people. And throughout the Old Testament, the Bible goes out of its way to show that God has compassion on the Anawim. God has compassion on those that society has forgotten about, that society has cast aside. God sees them, he cares about them, and he has compassion on them. Let's look at just a few verses that describe how God sees the Anawim says this, the Messiah will judge the lowly and determine equity for the Anawim of the earth. Isaiah 11, 4. Happy is the one who has mercy on the Anawim. Psalm, or excuse me, Proverbs 14, 21. The Anawim will not always be forgotten. You hear the promise there. Not always be forgotten, nor the hope of the afflicted perish forever. Psalm 9, 18. O Yahweh, you have heard the desire of the Anoim, 
You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear. Psalm 10, 17. The Anawim will inherit the earth and they will delight themselves in the abundant prosperity. Psalm 37, 11. Maybe that one sounds familiar to we, we looked at how Jesus actually quoted that verse in our last series called Blessed. The last one says this, Seek Yahweh, all you Anawim of the earth who do his command. Seek righteousness and seek humility. Zechariah 2, 3. Now, those are just some of examples. The Anawim is found all throughout the Old Testament, and it shows that God cares. He hears. He's inclining his ear. He knows their desires. He hears their prayers. The world may have forgotten about them, but God has not. See, the Anawim have a great need. They've been cast aside by many, but not by God. And I don't know all your stories, but my guess is, some of you can relate to the Anawim. Some of you have great needs that are going unmet. Some of you have been hurt and neglected and pushed aside. Some of you feel forgotten about by the world. But listen, what you need to know is while the world may have forgotten about you, while the world might have kept you aside, while the world might keep you at an arm's length, God has not. He has compassion on you. And Jesus, he continues this ministry. When he walks on this earth, he continues this ministry of going after the Anawim, going to those people that society, including the religious, wanted nothing to do with. He went straight to them. He talked with them. He ate meals with them. He touched them. The lepers, those who were banned from society, those who hadn't felt the touch of another human being in a handshake or a hug, for years, or maybe even their whole life, Jesus went to them. He went to the poor, the blind, those with disabilities. He went to the widows, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, those that society pushed aside and said, you're no good to us. You're the Anawim. You're the throwaway people. Jesus went straight to them. And he showed them compassion. And this is one of the things that got Jesus in so much trouble because you'd think if God came to earth, if he walked in our shoes, who would he want to spend time with? you think the most important person in the universe would want to spend the, his time with the most important people on the earth, the leaders, the elite, the rich, the powerful, the religious leaders, the priests. But Jesus seemed to butt heads with them and he almost seemed to prefer the company of the Anawim over anybody else. He came for the sick, the cast asides, the down and outs, the people that have screwed up so many times they thought all hope was lost. He went to them. He spent time with them. He loved them. He had compassion on them. And that's the second word I want to look at this morning is this word compassion. We know who God points his compassion to, the Anawim. And I want to take a closer look at what compassion actually means. Now, this is a Greek word, and it's a little bit harder to say, but I think you can say it. I'll, I'll put it on the screen so that you uh, can see how to sound it out. It's splachnizomai. Splachnizomai. And this is a word that we often translate as compassion, but really it goes much deeper than that. See, we think of compassion as just kind of feeling bad for somebody, feeling sorry for what they're going through. But this word, splachnizomai, goes so much deeper than that. And before we look at really what it means, I want to help you paint a picture of Jesus as he's embodying splachnizomai for the Anawim. So let's look at Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 35. Matthew says this, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. The Anawim, he's healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion. He had splachnizomai on them because they were harassed and helpless. You ever feel harassed and helpless? Jesus has compassion on people like that. They were like sheep without a shepherd. Now picture this. Jesus is going town to town. And every town he goes in, hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people come out to hear what he has to say and to be healed by him. There's a great need 
surrounding Jesus constantly. There's all these people that have this desperate need for something. Maybe it's healing. Maybe they've been suffering from some physical ailment and they need Jesus to heal them. Maybe they've just had a hard go at it in life. They've lost their friends, their families, their spouse, their kids, and they're just, they're just struggling. They've been dealt a bad hand and they're looking for Jesus for hope. Maybe they just don't have a direction in life. They don't have a purpose in life. They're going to Jesus, trying to find meaning in life. See, Jesus is surrounded by people with great needs, all different kinds of needs. People that have screwed up so many times that people have said, the society has said, the religious has said, there's no hope for you because you're no good. You just keep screwing up. They're going to Jesus, thinking maybe, maybe there's still hope for me. Jesus is surrounded by these kind of people. He's surrounded by the Anawim. And Matthew says that Jesus has compassion. He has splachnizomai on them. And again, most of our translations are going to say compassion, but I don't think that encompasses what's happening to Jesus in this moment. I don't think this tells us really what Jesus is experiencing. You see, this word, splachnizomai, literally means to be moved in the innermost part of your being. Jesus here isn't having compassion in his heart. He's having compassion like in his intestines, in his stomach. It's like he sees the need of these people and he's like disturbed by it. He's getting like an upset stomach. He's uncomfortable because of the level of compassion that he has on these people. You see, splachnizomai isn't a surface level of compassion. It's not, oh, I feel bad for you. Oh, I'm so sorry you're going through that. No, this is like, I can't sleep at night because I'm so disturbed. I have so much compassion for you that I can't move. I have so much compassion for you that I'm in the innermost part of my being. I feel this rumbling for you. And that's the level of compassion Jesus has in this moment as he's surrounded by all these people with all these great needs. He has compassion. He has splachnizomai on them. He's moved in the innermost part of his being to do something for them. In other words, Jesus isn't faking his compassion. He's not faking it. He was literally moved by the crowds of people around him. Now we need to pause here because I need you to understand something. We're going to look at how we can embody this compassion in just a minute, but before we can look at how we embody the compassion and take it to others, we need to understand something. We need to understand that this same level of compassion that God has for you, for, for them, he has for you and he has for me. God doesn't just have splachnizomai on those crowds 2,000 years ago. God has compassion on you. He has splachnizomai on you. He knows what you're going through. He knows the struggles you're facing. He knows the difficulties you've had. He knows the mistakes you've made. He knows what you've done and he knows what's been done to you. And he doesn't just feel sorry for you. No, he has splachnizomai for you. He's moved in the innermost part of his being for you. He hears your cries. He hears your prayers. He's not forgotten about you. The world might ignore you, but Jesus does not. He goes straight to you. He sits with you in your pain. He rejoices with you in your seasons of joy. He cries with you when you cry. He listens to you when you talk. He has splachnizomai on you. We need to understand this. See, the reality is we all live in a great need. We all have some kind of need in our life. Some are just more obvious than others. And we can't miss that what Jesus felt for others, he feels for us. He's compassion on you, not a surface level, but in the innermost part of his being. He cares about you, he loves you, and he's with you. I mean, that's why Jesus went to the cross, because he splachnizomide on us. And listen, the cross isn't just forgiveness of our sins, but don't hear me, don't, don't misquote me. He, it is for the forgiveness of our sins, but it's also to restore our relationship with him. Because what God wants more than anything else is to restore the relationship that's been severed between him and between you and between me. He wants to spend eternity with you. 
And it's that compassion that he has for you that motivated him to go to the cross so he could take on the penalty of your sin and the sins done to you so that he could restore your relationship. Jesus would literally go to hell, go through hell for you because he loves you, he cares about you, he has that level of compassion for you. He splachnizomize you. You see, we need to understand that because until we understand the level of compassion that God has for us, we can't take that to those around us. God is with you in your best moments and your worst moments. And he cares about what you're going through. God has moved in the innermost part of his being for you. And it's that love, it's that compassion that we're called to take to those around us. We're called to embody that same level of compassion for the people in our life, for the people we interact with, for the people that we see. We're called to take that splachnizomai and not just take it for ourselves, but to give it to those around us. And for some people in our life, that's easy, right? I mean, it's easy to splachnizomai your kids when they're listening, when they're being nice. It's a little bit harder when they talk back. It's easy to splock Nizomai for that coworker that cares deeply for you. It's a little bit harder to have compassion on that coworker that's rude, that takes credit, that doesn't work hard. You see, we're called to take compassion not just to the easy people in life, but to all the people that have a need in life. That's what Jesus did. He didn't just take splock Nizomai to his disciples, to his friends, he took it to strangers. See, Jesus had splock nizomai on the people that had a need. And that's what we're called to do too. We're called to take the splock nizomai to the onwim around us, to love them, to show them that while well, society's not forgotten about or has forgotten about them, we've not. While society turns a blind eye to them, we will not. And when we do that, we are being God's representatives, showing them that God cares about them too. That God has a better way for them to live. That God has hope for them. He has love for them. He has splachnizomai for them. We are his hands and feet. And we are called to go to the Anawim. So, let me ask you this question. Do you have that level of compassion for those in your life? How are you in embodying the compassion that God has for you for those around you. And I don't ask you that as somebody who's like, follow me, I'm doing such an incredible job at that. No, I struggle. There are days where if I'm honest, I'm not showing much, if any, compassion to those in my life. I'd rather give people some hard truth than compassion. But God's called me to embody the compassion he's given me to give to those around us. And in doing so, I'm bringing heaven to earth. I'm bringing light to the dark places in people's life. And so if you're like me, if you've got some work to do, here's three things that I think will help us cultivate compassion in our life and bring heaven to the dark places that exist around us. The first thing that we can do is we can ask God to help us embody compassion. Here's what I found in my life. I'm not really good at making meaningful changes in my life. I'm not really good at doing that on my own. I need God to cultivate what is good inside of me. And so what I need to do is I need to ask God to give me his heart to help me see what he sees, to help me feel what he feels. And listen, that can be a dangerous prayer because there are needs all around you. And if you start having splock knees on my on them, you're going to feel it in the innermost part of your being. So if you want to have more compassion on those in your life, it starts with asking God, not once, but regularly asking him to help you cultivate that compassion. It's not going to happen overnight. Growth takes time. But if you pray that prayer regularly, I promise, I promise you're going to start developing this compassion for those around you, those that have a need that's going unmet. God's going to start using you to start seeing what he sees and start feeling what he feels for those in your life. Second thing that you can do is you can just notice the Anawim. Stop turning a blind eye. 
Pay attention to those around you. Look at the people in your workplace, the people you see every day. Start listening to them. Start hearing what they're going through. My guess is you're surrounded by people that are in pain, people that are suffering, people that are going through some really difficult things. You're surrounded by people that are the Anawim. Some of their needs might be harder to see, but my guess is there's people all around you that are going through great pains and great suffering. And my guess is many of them feel alone. They feel like nobody notices them, nobody cares about them. So the second thing you can do is notice them, hear them. Don't turn away from them when they share their needs, but turn towards them. And the final thing you can do is go to them. Go to the people that nobody else will. Go to that person at the workplace that everybody else ignores. Go to that kid that sits alone at the lunch table. Go to your neighbor that everybody else hates. Go to the person that nobody else will because that's exactly what Jesus did for you and me. And when he walked this earth, he went to the people that nobody else would. And he changed the world. So go to the Anawi. And don't worry about the words you have to say. What I found is your presence is more valuable than your words could ever be. So just go. Notice them and go. Listen to them. Hear their stories. Embody the splachnizomai that Jesus has for you and take it to those around you. I don't think we have any idea the impact we could make if we just did that. This is our mission. This is our purpose in life. That passage that we looked at earlier, I want to end with it. Because I didn't actually give you the last couple verses of the passage. Where Jesus is surrounded by the Anawim. And the Bible tells us, Matthew tells us that he's going city to city preaching and healing. There's an interesting moment. Because what we would expect for Jesus to do is to keep doing this, right? We'd expect him to just keep healing, to keep going town to town and heal every single illness and sickness and disease and outcast. We'd expect him to go to every single person and just continue this on. After all, he has the means and he has the heart. He has the compassion. But Jesus does something surprising. He turns to his disciples and he says this in Matthew chapter 9, verse 37. Then he said to his disciples, so he's, he's healing everybody, and then he turns to his disciples and he says this, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out more workers into the harvest field. Listen, this is your plan, this is, or this is God's plan for you. This is your purpose. This is where we got the theme of the series, the harvest. That the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are are few. And this picture that Jesus is painting to his disciples is one that they understood very well, but we often don't. Because most of us, we've never harvested a field. Maybe some of you have, but most of us, we've never harvested a field. We just go to the grocery store when we want food. But in old times, in Jesus' days, when you wanted to eat, you had to harvest. And when the harvest was ready, when your food was ready to be plucked, you have a window You have a window to go harvest it. If you wait too long, the food's going to go rotten. So this idea that Jesus is painting isn't just that there's a lot of work out there. It's a time-sensitive matter. The harvest is now. There's a window. There are people that are suffering. There are people that are struggling. There's Anawim, the harvest, all around us. People in great need. And they can't wait. They can't wait. They need workers now. The harvest is plentiful. There are people all around us in incredible needs, in incredibly dark places. There's hell all around us. And it's our job to go into the field to bring heaven to earth. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And the the question that we need to ask ourselves is, are we going to get in the game or are we going to stay on the sidelines? Are we going to harvest the field or are we going to hope that somebody else comes along and does that for us? Because it's God's mission, it's God's purpose for you to go into the field and to harvest. And what you need to ask yourself is, are you going to do that? Are you going to embody the compassion that God has for you? Because church, we can't give up. we got to get into the game. Jesus has given us a mission. He's given us a purpose. So let me ask you, who are the Anawim in your life? 
Who are those that have a great need around you? And how can you embody compassion for them? And just imagine, just imagine what God can do through you if you did that. If you noticed the Anawim and you took compassion to them. I think we'd see a lot more places in our community, a lot more places in this country, and a lot more places around the world that look less like hell and more like heaven. When workers rise up and go into the field, when they embody the compassion that God has for them and they take it to the Anawim, our world looks a little bit more like heaven. So go, get into the field, go after the Anawim. Let's pray.